All right, hello everyone. I'm George Wilson. I work at the Queensland Functional Programming Lab, which is in Australia under Data 61. And I am here today to talk to you about laws. Yeah. All right, um, cool. So I'm going to tell you all about laws today. I'm going to be using Haskell. In Haskell, we use type classes as our sort of primary means of abstraction. And one really interesting thing that we do in Haskell that I don't see in a lot of other communities that I think is really valuable is we have we attach laws to our type classes. So these are these are invariants or properties that any instance of this type class must obey. Okay, and laws give us a lot of power, a lot of advantages when we use our abstractions or when we think about our abstractions. So today I want to tell you all about laws and why I think they're so amazing. Um, I think quite often you'll go to a talk about Haskell, and they'll, they'll tell you about this amazing type class. They'll say, oh my goodness, you have never seen anything as brilliant as Comonets, or, or, or Traversable, or whatever the thing is of the thing of the day. And they'll say, all right, this is Comonet, it's got, it can do all this stuff. It's got these laws, don't worry about them too much, but oh my goodness, you can do this stuff. Right? And so this talk is intended to be the opposite. I will do nothing but worry about laws. So let's get right into it. This is Monoid. It's a type class that's quite prevalent in Haskell. It's in the base library, so as soon as you start writing Haskell, you have access to this. And Monoid is a type class with two members. One of the members is called less than, greater than. Uh, I will pronounce it append. Um, and what append does is it takes two things about type M and it combines them in some way to produce a, a third one. Okay, so we can, you know, append is good for smashing stuff together, basically. Uh, and then we have M empty, uh, M for monoid, and then empty. I'll generally pronounce it empty because it's easier to say. Uh, and, and this is what it means to be a monoid, except there are also laws that you must obey to be a monoid. And these are the three laws here. They are the left identity law, the right identity law, and associativity. The left identity law says if you append empty, onto something, onto something, let's call it y, the result of that must be equal to y. So appending empty kind of, it, it doesn't do anything. It, we call this the identity element or the neutral element. So there's different, people call it different things. The right identity law is fairly similar, except it's flipped around. So if you append empty on the right hand side, that should also not do anything. So empty, if you append it on either side, nothing happens. Then we have associativity. And associativity says, if you're going to combine three things, call them x, y, and z, then if you choose to combine x with y first, and then combine that result with z, that should give you the same answer as if you combine x with the result of combining y with z. Okay, so another way of thinking about that is we can add and remove parentheses wherever we want, and we won't change the result. We won't change the program. All right. Let's look at some examples of monoids, just to make sure that we know what's going on. So addition is a great example of a monoid. So here we can make a data type sum, and, and sum simply wraps up an integer. And we can give a monoid instance for sum that says, if I've got two integers and I want to combine them, I combine them with addition. And if I need an empty integer, the empty integer with respect to addition is zero. Okay? Now let's look at our laws in terms of addition. So the left identity law says, in terms of addition, says if you add zero to y, that's the same as y. The right identity law says if we have x and we add zero, we get x. So we can look at some examples, say if we add zero to five, we get five. If we add zero to seven on the other side, we get seven. All right, so we're looking good for left and right identity. Associativity, if we're going to add, say, three, four, and five, there are two different ways we could go about doing this. We could put the parentheses to the left or to the right. Uh, and and I think parentheses are a pretty bad way of looking at associativity. Okay, when, when we're talking about associativity, even I've done it, I've said, oh, we can put parentheses in. What I really want you to think about with associativity is I want you to think about trees of computation. Associativity says I can restructure this tree. Okay, so we can draw some trees. So here are two different ways we can evaluate this expression, either in a left associated way or a right associated way. So if we add 3 to 4, we get 7. Then if we add 5 to that, we get 12. Or if we've chosen the other way, right, we could add 4 to 5 to get 9, and 3 to that to get 12. All right, so this is the associative property at work. Okay, so we've looked at some integers. 
Another excellent example of a monoid that I really love is list. So lists are a monoid. The empty list is the empty uh, with respect to the list monoid. And if we have a left list and we want to append it to a right list, well, what we do is we pattern match on the left list. If the left list is empty, then the result is the right list. If the left list is not empty, it has a head and a tail. So we append the, so we cons the head onto the recursive result of appending the tail onto the right list. So what this will do is it will walk through the left list and then once it gets to the end, it will stick the right list there and we've, we've appended the lists. Uh, it's recursively defined over the recursive structure of lists. Okay, and this also turns out to obey these laws, left identity, right identity, and associativity. So if we append the empty list, that's the same as not doing any appending at all. And it turns out that this works in an associative way as well. So we can, we can, you know, we can restructure the tree of computation. So list is an excellent example of a monoid. <coughs> and you're like, yeah, well, that's cool, George. I mean, sure, you can write monoid and you can have some examples of it. But it's not a very useful abstraction unless we can write some functions in terms of it, right? So we, we tend to abstract over things so that we can work purely in terms of the abstraction without uh, referring to the details of the concretion. So let's write a function that works just with monoids. This function is called mconcat. And mconcat says, if you've got a list of stuff and the stuff happen to be monoids, I can take the whole list and smash them all together into a single value. I can do that with the, mono with the monoid operation. So let's look at how this is defined. We take in our list and we pattern match on it. If it's the empty list, we give back the empty from our monoid. Um, that's actually the only thing we can do, which I think is very cool, but that's another talk. Um, anyway, if the list is not empty, then it has a head and a tail. So we take the head and we append that onto the recursive result of m concatting the tail. Okay, so we walk through our list, m concatting, uh, uh, m appending as we go, and we end up with a single final result that is the aggregate of the list in whatever our monoid happens to be. This is a really useful function and I use it all the time in my day job. Um, maybe you do as well. It's a really good one as far as functions go. So here's what an example of using it might look like. We've got you know one, two, three, and four in a list and we can add them all together and the evaluation of that will look something like this. So We'll add one to the result of adding three, to, uh, two to the result of adding three to the result of adding four to zero, and then we collapse the recursion. Um, and this turns out to be right associated because the structure of lists is right, is recursive to the right. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that because we've got associativity. We get 10. Um, so you say, all right, so that's cool, George. I believe that monoid is a useful abstraction because we have some instances of it and we can write some functions in terms of it. But have we actually used the laws? Why do the laws matter? I thought this talk was laws. Well, don't worry, it is. All right, so I'll, I want to show you why the laws matter by giving you a counterexample, something that's not a monoid. And my counterexample is subtraction. Subtraction does not form a monoid. So we could make a data type that wraps up a subtraction. And then we could give it a like broken evil monoid instance that breaks the laws and it says well if you want to combine two numbers you subtract one from the other and uh, the empty subtraction is zero I suppose um, but once we start actually looking at whether this follows the laws it turns out that it doesn't um, it breaks two out of three of them so left identity in expressed in, in subtraction would look like this right zero sub minus y is y well that turns out not to be true because negative five is not the same as five so we don't have left identity. We've broken this law. Um, it, we sort of incidentally do have right identity. Um, and associativity, if we look at that, there are two ways we could parenthesize this. Um, but parentheses are not a very good way to visualize associativity, so I'll draw some trees. Um, these trees will give us very different answers. If we subtract 5 from 11, we get 6. And then if we subtract 2 from that, we get 4. But if we first subtract 2 from 5, we get 3. And if we subtract that from 11, we get 8. And 8 is not the same as 4. So we don't have associativity for subtraction. All right, well, maybe we can still get some use out of it. You know, maybe we could still call mconcat to do a bunch of subtractions for us. You know, this, this could work, right? Well, let's look at the definition of mconcat. Oh, yeah, right. I forgot, right? Earlier on, we, we, I mentioned mconcat is recursive to the right because it just naturally follows the recursive structure of lists, which are recursive to the right. 
That's a real shame because when I subtract, I actually want things associated to the left or I get the wrong answer. Right? That's a huge catastrophe. I'm going to get four instead of eight or something, something even more wrong than that. Um, maybe I'll get a negative when I wanted a positive and then, you know, how, did, how, did, how do I have negative bananas? I don't know what happened here. Well, you associated to the right when you should have associated to the left. You did not have the associative property, so you could not perform, you know, what happened there. Um, so, uh, like, this is pretty bad. We can't use mconcat because it, it sort of is associated the wrong way. Maybe we could still salvage this, right? Maybe we can still figure out how to get some use out of this. One option is we could sort of, we could call this mconcat r, and then we could also have mconcat l. So we could have two different versions, one which associates all the way to the left and one which associates all the way to the right. This is something we could do. Um, and it's not too important the details of the, the bottom one, but please believe me that that left associates all the events. Um, but my, my big problem with this is sort of, the whole point of having monoid was so that we didn't have to really care whether it was associated to the left or the right. You know, we, we've broken our abstraction. When I came to use subtraction with my monoid, I had to think, I had to stop and think, oh, does mconcat go to the left or the right? And now, now I have to have two functions instead of one, you know, because of this one trivial example of subtraction, right? So, you know, if I didn't have these laws, then as I found new instances of my abstraction, I would have to keep coming along and changing the members because now I need two instead of one. Maybe I'll find an even more broken example and then I'll need to change something else. You know, so then as I kind of accumulate these instances, my abstraction kind of gets watered down into this mush of like, I don't know what it means anymore. If that makes any sense. Besides which, mconcat r and mconcat l are sort of strictly weaker versions of fold right and fold left from the standard library. Um, these functions are for consuming lists. And one of them is sort of left associated and the other is right associated. And this is, these are actually better than mconcat l and mconcat r as I showed you before because they have more general types. So you can use these in more circumstances. If you really need your, your uh, subtraction associated to the left, you could simply use fold left. Um, you don't have to go and make a fake monoid instance that breaks the laws and then go and ruin mappend by having two of them. Um, so I would prefer this to having a broken monoid instance that broke the laws. Uh, our abstraction sort of fell apart as soon as we didn't have the laws. We, we had to water it down and and split things in half, and then we have to think about, oh, how's that defined again? And I, I don't want to worry about it. But laws help me not worry about things. I can trade worrying about other things for worrying about laws, and I find it's like nearly always an excellent trade, perhaps always. So let's look at some more examples. So we'll, we'll, we'll use some laws for good. We won't look at broken law things anymore. Let's write a greeting function. So this function takes a list of characters and produces a list of characters. As we know, list, uh, because in Haskell strings are lists of characters, as we know from a previous slide, lists are monoids, so we can, we can get some monoid stuff happening. And a greeting takes a name and produces the string, hello, name, how are you? But this greeting is for a list programmer, and so we surround it with parentheses so that they can read it. Um, so if you're playing conference bingo, you can tick off the list joke bit. Um, even despite the very short and terse nature of this function, I demand to refactor it because that's the sort of person I am. So I'm going to split out a useful helper function to do the parenthesizing for me because I've got, I've got sort of one parenthesis all the way over on the left and I've got another parenthesis all the way over on the right. And, you know, if my boss walks up to me next week and says, oh, we're, we're greeting closure programmers now, I need those to be square brackets instead. Um, then I have to kind of remember to go to both places and update them. So I'd really like to factor out so the parentheses are right next to each other. So what I'll do is I'll write a little helper function. This helper function is called between. And it says, give an opening and a closing and something to go in the middle. Simply append the opening to the stuff in the middle to the closing. Now I can refactor this. And I can say, between parentheses, hello name, how are you? And I find this more readable. And maybe you don't, and that's all right. Um, but I really, what I really like about this is I factored out this little function between. Between is a very useful function. I can reuse it all over the place. Watch. I reused it. So I can say between parentheses, between hello, how are you, put the name. Maybe you might argue this is refactoring too far, but I, I did reuse between. No one can tell me that I can't. Um, 
But what's really amazing and mind-blowing and powerful about this example is that here I was in the world of strings, strings before me in every direction, and I was, I was working with strings, I was thinking very stringy thoughts, and I, I broke out this sort of little helper function, and, and the little helper function was very useful with my strings, but this helper function actually works with any monoid, just for free. I didn't even have to think about monoids. Haskell's type inference will infer that this function works for any monoid, and that's just unbelievable. That's really incredible. I can use this for any monoid, even though I was just, I was deep in the string mind. All right, I just, I find that so wonderful. I can pull out little helper functions, and Haskell tells me, this is much more useful than you even thought. It's, it's really exciting, and it happens all the time. Usually I'm not doing string stuff, though. Um, but did you notice that when we refactored, when we pulled out the between function, we changed the associativity of what was going on? This is a talk about laws. Right, so originally everything was associated all the way to the right because that's what the fixity declaration of the append operator says. But when we pulled out between and put the two parentheses, sort of when we start, when we thought about the two parentheses and what goes between them, we actually ended up having this computation. We had the parentheses, and then in the middle we had this other little subtree. So we just by refactoring our strings, we changed the associativity of this expression. I argue that you already use associativity all the time, and you might not even know it. Okay, so I think look, by knowing about associativity, you'll be able to use it even more, and refactor and reuse even more. Okay, so, so I kind of feel like my job is already kind of done. I don't even have to convince you that associativity is good. You're, you already love associativity. All right, and now, you know, if, you, if you've just learned about associativity, now you can go and do it even more. It's great. So I think laws let us refactor and reuse more. That refactoring, even though it was subtle, that refactoring only worked because of the associativity of concatenating lists. Okay, we were able to reuse that function. That was really cool as well. That works for any monoid. Any monoid will also allow us to restructure things in that way. And that we just got that for free. I think that's really cool. Um, but I've, I've sort of kept something quiet until now, and maybe some of you have noticed it if you know a lot about lists and monoids and stuff, which is that laws don't really say anything about performance. I can, I can put parentheses in and take them out as much as I'd like, and I will get the same answer, but I might get it next week instead of tomorrow. Laws don't tell us anything about performance. They just tell us that the program will give the same answer. They don't say anything about when. Uh, and in particular, I want to walk you through an example where choosing one associativity over the other has, has a bad outcome. So in the case of appending lists, it turns out that lists really like to be appended in a right associative way, so with all the parentheses to the right. In a case like this, where we have a left associated list append, it's, it's not a very happy situation to be in uh, because it's a bit slower. So I'll, I'll explain why. So we have our lists here. We have three lists. One, two, three, nil is one list. Four, five, six, nil is another list. And seven, eight, nine, nil is the third list. We're going to append these three together, and we're going to do so starting from the left. So we're going to append first. We'll append one, two, three, under four, five, six. Well, we walk through the left list. So one, two, three. We get to the end, and we stick the right list there. All right. So we've done sort of half the work now. We've appended. We've done one of our two append operations that we need to do. We can garbage collect the first list. All right, now let's append 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 onto 7, 8, 9. Well, we walk through the left list, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we get to 7, 8, 9. The problem here is that we repeated work. We had already walked through 1, 2, 3, but then we had to go and walk through 1, 2, 3 again in our second append. Okay? List append is... List append is... Um, takes linear time in the length of the left list. But when we left associate our list appends, we're building up a bigger and bigger left list as we go. So each time we do an append, the next append becomes more expensive. And that really matters if we're appending a lot of lists together. I mean, this isn't even a lot of lists. This will still be fast enough. But imagine I had so many lists I couldn't fit them all on a slide, and they were all very long. And then I really, really couldn't fit them on a slide then having left associated appends is a disaster. 
you know, and you might think, it, you know, because it, it'd be, it'd be n squared. It's because we're building up the bigger list on the left, as I said. But there is a solution to this, right? There is a solution. So you might be pretty down on associativity at the moment. You're saying, George, come on, I can, I can refactor and restructure all my code, but it may or may not get slower. That's pretty, like, that's not very cool. That's not really on. Um, but as laws taketh away, laws giveth as well. All right, so I'm going to show you a data structure called DList. And DList fixes the problem of left associated list depends. It is the ultimate sledgehammer of fixing that problem. And the way it works is a DList is sort of like a list. Uh, in fact, we can convert between, we can convert a regular list into a DList. Um, and, do, and it is constant time to do so. And the way we do that is we suspend the computation of appending that list. We sort of, we say, I'm going to append this list to some other stuff later. Okay, and then if, we, if we're done doing DList stuff and we want to go back to a regular list, then we just call it with the empty list. Okay, so we get the function out of the DList. So a DList is a function. We get the function out, call it on the empty list. It gets us back our original list. This takes linear time in the length of that list. And DList, much like list, has a monoid instance where what it does is it combines these suspended list appends. Okay, so it, it does that simply with function composition. So we just glue the two functions together. We've got one function that says, I'm going to append my list to some stuff. And then we've got another function that says, I'm going to append my list to some stuff. We just glue them together. So we've got like a combined suspended list append to one day do later. And the amazing trick about DList is that no matter how you associate your DList appends, when you go and say, go back to a real list, it will right associate everything and then do the ideal <coughs> linear time walk over the lists. It does this with pure black magic and um, I linked to a blog post about how it actually works. But for now, please believe me. Um, and this thing obeys some laws. There are some really cool properties that these functions I've just shown you have. For example, toList is a left inverse of from list. What that means is if I have a list and I call from list, I turn it into a D list, and then I call to list, I actually go back to a regular list. And it's the same list. I always get the same list if I just go back and forth. That's a really useful property. We also have another useful property that from list is a monoid homomorphism. And you say, George, what on earth is a monoid homomorphism? I'm going to tell you what it is. So from list is a function between two monoids. It goes from list, which is a monoid, to DList, which is a monoid. So a monoid homomorphism goes between two monoids, and it obeys some laws. So if we call from list on the, the empty list, we should get the empty DList, according to DList's monoid instance. Right? So we, or another way to put that is we preserve identity. So if you put the identity through the transformation, you end up at the identity of the other side. The other amazing thing that from list obeys as a monoid homomorphism is this property that says if you append x to y and then turn that whole thing into a DList, you get exactly the same thing as if you had turned x into a DList, turned y into a DList, and then appended the two DLists. So this function lets you effectively, or more simply, or more informally, what it lets you do is it lets you do your monoid stuff either before or after translating into DLists. And it turns out that doing it after has performance benefits. So we can choose to do that. So if we have some, uh, you know, if we have some collection of list depends, then what we can do is we can, we can use equational reasoning. We can work through with our laws and we can say, all right, well, if I put a, from li a to list and a from list out the front, I won't change the answer. So I can do that. This is the same answer by that law. I haven't changed what the program does. And then by the monoid homomorphism property, whenever I have a from list outside a, a, an expression which is a collection of appends, I can replace that with from list on each of the constituent parts of that append, and then append in the world of DLists. Okay, so I can do that. And now I've got from list on all my lists to turn them into DLists, append them as DLists, and then right at the end, call to list to, call the, to turn the whole thing into a list and do so with right associated appends so that it goes at the ideal performance, which is linear time. And then, it, so if we have lots of things, we from list them all, we append them all, and then whether our appends were left or right, we still get the best performance. All right. 
So I think that's pretty cool. This trick only works because list is a monoid, delist is a monoid, and the from list function is a monoid homomorphism. So we took advantage of like five or six different laws to get this performance benefit. But what's really, and I'll show you a diagram of it as well. So left associated depends at n squared. Um, that's bad. What we do instead is we call from list. From list is constant time, but we have to call it once for each of our lists, so that's n. And then we're in the world of delists. We do our, all our appends. Um, we have n appends to do. So that takes us n time. And then we call to list, which takes us n because we have to walk over the entire structure of the list. And if you know anything about computational complexity theory, you'll know that n plus n plus n is n. Right, and so we beat n squared, we got the same answer, we got the best performance, it's awesome. What's really amazing is that the, the same delist trick with a few modifications can be made to work for any monoid. This is not just about lists. This will work for any monoid you've got lying around. So if you've got a monoid that is way faster if it's right associated or something, you can hit it with this hammer and then it will just be right associated no matter how you actually associate your code. Uh, same thing if you, uh, if you need it to be left associated for performance reasons, hit it with this hammer again in a slightly different way and you can get everything to be left associated instead. It's just incredible. It works for any monoid because laws. There was nothing list specific about what we did. That's really incredible. So I use this trick all the time. In fact, there are even, not only does this work for other monoids, there are similar structures to delist that work for even for other abstractions other than monoids. Okay, so there's a whole family of these tricks to just say, oh, it's faster if it's right associated, just right associate everything for me. It's amazing that we can just do this. It's really cool and it's laws. Only works because laws. So I'll give a, a sort of made up definition here um, that optimization is altering the program to get the same answer more efficiently. I think this is a fairly reasonable definition. Um, if you alter the program and then get a different answer, it wouldn't really be fair to call that optimizing. You're writing a different program, right? So optimizing is when we get the same answer more efficiently. And laws are all about changing in such a way that you get the same answer. So naturally, laws can give rise to optimizations, as we've just seen. And I love taking advantage of all these things all the time. It's really cool. Um, so you're like, oh, wow, this is pretty cool stuff, George. I can refactor more. I can reuse my code more. I can, I can even optimize my code more, you know. So I'm pretty sold on laws. They're pretty incredible. But what, does, what kind of horrible tragedies will befall us without laws? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm all sold on laws, but I'm still not scared enough of no laws. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to show you a horrible, terrible world without laws that, that makes me very sad and unhappy. There's a type class in Haskell called default. And default has one member called def, and it is a it is a thing of type A. So we can give some defaults here. So the default list is the empty list. Um, the default int is zero, and there are no laws on this type class. There's nothing that tells us kind of what these members are supposed to mean or how they're supposed to relate to each other. In fact, there's only one member, so it can't really relate to anything else. But but that's sort of beside the point. So I kind of I can't really disagree that the empty list is the default list with that type signature, but I take big issue with zero being the default int, okay? You would only think zero is the default int if you did addition all day. If the only thing you ever do when it's like you come across an int and you say, oh, an int, addition, right? Then you think zero is the default int. But, you know, if you prefer multiplication, like say if you work in the product department, right? <laughs> right? then one would be your idea of a default int, right? And, you know, if we're going to try and say that zero is the default int, let's not even get started on division. It won't go well. So I, I really take issue with this idea that there can be a default with no laws to kind of ground it to anything else. Monoid has empty, and empty, it, you know, it has the same type as, as the sort of default from default. But the left identity and the right identity laws tell us how empty relates to our operation, our append. We've got this relationship between the two members of the class that kind of give the class an overall meaning and, and you know, capacity to be understood, whereas default does not have this. Um, it's, it's pretty uncool. So we've been looking up, uh, but we could maybe salvage it, right? 
I mean, if we've got an abstraction, if it doesn't have laws, maybe that's okay. Maybe we could still write a function that works in terms of that abstraction. So I've tried to write one here. It's called or default. And it says if I've got a maybe A, but there's a default A, I can give you an A. And the way I'll do that is I'll pattern match on the maybe. If the maybe has an A inside, I'll give you that one. If the maybe does not have an A inside, I will give you the default A. And this is a function defined in terms of the default type class. It, it sort of works. You could use this function. Um, but I argue there is a, a sort of, by my view, strictly better function called or else. And or else says, give me an A and a maybe A, and I'll give you an A. And it does a similar thing. It pattern matches on the maybe. If the maybe is just A, it gives you the A. Or if the maybe is nothing, it gives you the A that you gave it first. So the difference is, or else lets you provide your own default. It doesn't mention the default type class anywhere. Um, and I think this is quite good because, like, let's say, for example, I want to multiply some things. Well, then, or default wouldn't be very useful because I would get zeros everywhere, and zeros aren't very good friends with multiplication. Um, so, you know, since default doesn't have any actual meaning, I would much prefer to be able to provide my own default at every use case independently. So I think this function is better, so I think default doesn't actually give me anything. Maybe you could write some other functions that work in terms of default, but I don't know what they are. Um, so this is from the data default uh, package on, on Hackage. This is a Haskell package, people are using it. Um, there's a competitor to data.default that I actually find a lot funnier, which is called Acme default. Acme is sort of what you put on your Haskell package if it's a joke package. Um, and whereas data.default is for, uh, is a class for types with a default value, Acme default is a class for types with a distinguished, aesthetically pleasing value. So let's look at some instances. It defines exactly the same type class, but it gives wildly different instances. So uh, here we go. The default int64 is negative one. The reason that this library is actually a lot better than the actual default library is because this one documents why the things are the default. So um, the default in 64 is negative one because that's the biggest negative number. I argue that's just about as good as picking zero because it's the identity for addition. Um, like, unless you're living in an addition world. Um, the default bool is false, and it's false because the library author asked his friend he said, hey, do you have a favorite Boolean? And his friend said, no. And he said, ah, no, that's false. <laughs> there's, a, there's an issue open on the repository at the moment, and I really hope that we can get a pull request and get this one merged. But uh, some wonderful person has suggested that a good default string might be the entire text of Moby Dick. But I think, you know, I, I think that's as good a string as any, really. Um, Anyway, we've had a bit of fun with this section. I don't want to make, you know, I don't want to be too harsh on data.default. It has a job. Um, its job is to overload a name. Uh, it overloads the name DEF and it lets you use DEF in lots of different circumstances. So, you know, it, it does overload a name. Um, I find it kind of ironic that DEF is two characters longer than zero. So, so I have, we've kind of cost ourselves three times as much work in typing by overloading that name. But that's sort of besides the point. Um, so I think now you're all really sold on laws and really terrified of not laws, hopefully. And you're saying, all right, George, I'm going to use all these amazing abstractions like Monoid that have laws. But I, when I make my own instances, how could I possibly know whether I obey the laws? Right? If I make an instance that doesn't obey the law, it could be a very subtle cause of bugs. Uh, and I, I think I've seen some, some subtle bugs that have been caused by an instance that was wrong in like a really specific case. So it's, it's important to determine that you obey the laws if you're going to make an instance of a type class that has laws. There's a really excellent way to do that, um, which is to use the property-based testing library QuickCheck, which has a library, another library on top of it called Checkers. And QuickCheck is for property-based testing, and Checkers is a library full of um, sort of pre-canned test cases for all the different laws. So for the monoid laws, for the functor laws, for the monad laws, for whatever other laws you've got. So for example, it's just got this thing called monoid, and monoid is a batch of tests that test all the monoid laws. There's the same for functor, same for all sorts of different abstractions that have laws. I use checkers all the time to check my laws, and sometimes I'm wrong and I have to fix things. I think it's really valuable to be able to do that, to, do that, to, to test the laws. Um, it would be much better to write a proof that the laws hold. Um, 
but that's sort of difficult in Haskell. We don't really have the capacity to like build in a proof next to the instance, or we could with like tremendous difficulty, but uh, testing is sort of really lightweight and works pretty well. So I really like using checkers. So for example, if we took our broken subtraction monoid that doesn't actually work, and say we wanted to test that, and we also wanted to test addition, we would define a main here in our test suite that simply says, run the monoid test for, for addition, and run the monoid test for subtraction. And we just really have to write only a little bit more code than I've got on screen to get it working. Uh, and then it, we can run this, and it will say, all right, I tried 1,500 times to break the laws for addition, and I could not. Um, so that gives some sort of reasonable confidence. It, it could still be broken, right? But we have 1,500 cases where it doesn't that were automatically generated for us. Um, whereas for subtraction, it was quite quickly able to tell that left identity and associativity don't work for subtraction. So I really like these libraries for testing my laws. I do it all the time. It's very helpful when sort of, I mean, I think sometimes the laws are kind of obviously true, like in a, in a really simple addition case or something like that. But when I've got this big complicated structure I've built up by composing all these other structures and then I want to get just the right monoid that does the thing I want, it's, it's really helpful to be able to do this. <coughs> so I think laws, laws give rise to useful functions that we otherwise couldn't have. Um, they allow us to refactor our code in ways that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. And in some cases they can help us to optimize our code. Okay, so um, today I've spent a lot of time talking about associativity and monoids. There are so many other wonderful structures that have associativity, even associativity that, that is just shaped sort of differently, like monads have an associativity property but it looks a little different. Uh, and that, this is not just associativity, there's lots of other things. There's commutativity, there's item potency, there's distributivity, there's lots more things I couldn't fit on a slide or couldn't remember. Um, you know, Functor has laws of identity and composition that don't even kind of fit this shape. They're kind of, because Functor has a different shape. Uh, there's just so many laws out there and they're wonderful and you should go and learn all about them and use them to help write better code and have more fun. So I think uh, the kind of key point that I want to drive home here is that I think laws are the difference between an overloaded name and a real sort of true abstraction. We want to write in terms of our abstractions without relying on the concrete details and I think laws really get us there in a way that we otherwise don't get there. Thanks. That's the end of the talk. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we have some time for some questions. Yeah, so default it has value zero because otherwise if if uh, if you put laws on it, it will become a monoid of identity. Yeah, yeah. There, I don't think there are any laws we could put on default. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's default, like you said, like you are not happy with the value zero. Yeah, so I'm I was trying more to illustrate the point that I'm not happy with the concept of having a type class for it. Um it it, it, it wasn't exactly an attack on zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with your monoid homomorphism, you had uh, like you had the the first thing, which is from list empty is empty. Yep. I was thinking back to Tony's thing that he's been going on about today and yesterday, which is reverse of empty is empty, and then the second one is reverse of x plus reverse of y is reverse of y plus x. Yeah. That's almost. A monoid homomorphism, but not quite. Why is that? Does it not preserve? Because it's it's uh, it's instead of uh, so you got from list x plus from list y, mm. and that's from from list of x plus y, but reverse flips those. But I think it flips it in a consistent way. Okay. I think reverse. So you think it's a I think reverse is cool. a monoid homomorphism. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. There's a there's a monoid um, there's a wrapper in in base in Haskell called dual or rev or something and it's just it gives you a monoid that's the other monoid but with the arguments flipped i think that monoid has some relationship to the reverse function yeah i think it is yeah in a fast and loose way if you went to if you went to tony's talk if you get into this you'll break but hopefully we went to tony's talk and that's all okay 
Any other? Yeah, I've got a question in the back. So the question is uh, more around property-based testing. Yeah, cool. Like, uh, as you mentioned in this example, uh, basically sum zero, the specific type is integer. So the tools that whatever you mentioned will do well. But uh, what if my monoid type is a uh, type that I defined like a wave type or something else? So how good are those tools that uh, they verify the monoid or different laws? Like just a question based on that. Yeah, okay. So you're saying if it's not int, if you've got a what did you say? Sorry about the about the type. So custom type. Uh, do I have to like uh, uh, spend time in uh, creating a text pictures and different different things to or uh, the tool whatever you are telling yeah, suggested yeah. tools they inherently thinks that I mean verifies the loss or how to, how easy is to test that property based testing when you have custom types. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, with this library quick check, and there's another one I really like called Hedgehog that Mark gave a talk about earlier on. Um, they give you a set of uh, generators, and generators are these random generators for, and you've got ints and strings and bools and, and stuff, and lists and whatever. Um, th what these libraries do is they give you a way to combine these generators into bigger ones. So your type might be a person which has a name and age and an address, you know, string, int and string, and string or, or whatever. Um, you can use these primitive generators like the string generator, the int generator, and the string generator to build up a person generator that, that you could then use to test the laws. <coughs> yeah, cool. What's the library? Uh, the one I mentioned in the talk was Quick Check, and the other one that I sort of like a bit more is called Hedgehog. Um, but testing the laws in Hedgehog is something we don't quite have working yet, I think. Yeah, there have been a few attempts at it, but they haven't gotten up to the level that Checkers is at. So, like, I've got a Haskell project where I've got a great big hedgehog test suite that does most of my tests. And then I've got this little tiny quick check hedge, uh, uh, test suite that only runs Checkers. Um, and so that's my solution at the moment. I'd like to see testing of laws for hedgehog. The problem comes in with um, when you're testing the functor laws, you need to be able to generate, randomly generate a function. and that's much more difficult in Hedgehog because of the way Hedgehog is implemented than it is in Quick Check. I think we can do it now, though. One of my colleagues was having a go at that. So maybe we'll be testing all our laws with Hedgehog and all this will be out of date. That would be cool. I think those are all the questions. Oh, one more. So if we try to create our own type class, then we would need to come up with our own laws that satisfy it, or do we have some guidelines for it? Or how do we make up our own laws so that we can put them into a quick check and verify them? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. So if I'm going to make my own type class, what laws should I give it? Or, or how should I determine what laws to give it, or even to give it laws. Um, say, for example, if it builds on another type class, like if you make a specialization of monoid, then you'd certainly hope that it's still a monoid. Um, I think a lot of type classes aren't like that, though. Um, I think a lot of type classes sort of are of the type of the default thing, where they just overload a name so that you can use that name in lots of different places. Um, often, you sort of can't give it laws in that case. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say so much. Um, the sort of parable of the evil of the default type class was um, to drive home a point and not necessarily saying that you should have, that you should have type class. You should never have a type class with no laws. Um, I, I suppose it's sort of, I don't know what to say. It sort of comes with experience. You can kind of say, I'm using this. I think this. most of these sorts of things happen to look commutative or associative or whatever. I think that's the right fit for whatever I'm doing. Or sort of look at the problem you're trying to solve and what properties you might need. Um, in, I guess how I answer that question for myself is I sort of, I usually don't write many type classes. I tend to import lots of type classes from other libraries and then they already have laws that were thought up by people who are much smarter than me. Um, and so I just use everyone else's type class and they've been 
thinking about maths for the last 30 years is the more I would call it esoteric. Um, so I use theirs. If I could just follow on from that question a little bit. Um, so when we write type classes, um, should it have laws or should we look for laws and so on? And um, I think a really useful uh, litmus test to answer that question, to your question, which is to um, all, all type classes you can write as a data type, um, including monoid. And so even in your head or write the actual code, write it as a data type and then ask the question, is that a better way to do it if, if you can't come up with laws? So like take the default, for example. Um, as a data type, it's called identity. So the code is data identity A equals identity A, just wrapped up in A. And uh, I, I think in that case, I, I, so I agree with George about the whole evilness of default and so on. Um, should we should that have been a data type that just gets explicitly passed in instead of a type class? And I think that one's a really obvious one where as a data type, um, it's much better because there were no laws. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Tony. All right. Can we take this one then? I think we've just run out of time. Thank you so much, George. All right. Thanks for the great.